and welcome to this session with uh, uh, Jean-Francois Camilleri from uh, Disney Nature in Paris. In fact, uh, he was just telling me that he joined Disney nearly 40 years ago. No, no. That in was the me. early 40s, yeah. <laughs> in, the, no, in 88. 88, yeah. And you've worked with Disney on and off ever since then? I've been working with Disney uh, ever since 1988 uh, in different jobs, but mostly in, uh, in motion picture. And in the past 10 years, uh, there were a big reorganization within, within Disney. So I'm now overseeing all the businesses for Disney in France, Holland, Belgium, and uh, uh, French-speaking Africa. Mm -hmm. And you were responsible for bringing Disney and nature together again in uh, 19, oh, sorry, 19, in uh, 2007, 2008. Uh, but it's, it seems to me, let's, let's start with the, the, the marriage of Disney and nature, because it seems like a marriage made in heaven, really, doesn't it? And in fact, Disney and nature had come into contact before yeah. Disney and nature was created. What, what's your first exposure to it? Well, I would say Disney and nature, I mean, nature has always been in the heart of Disney content. Um, I mean, you all know Bambi, uh, Jungle Book, um, even 101 Dalmatian or Aristocats, Lion King, and, and many more, of course. And animals have always been playing a very important role in Disney movies, because I think Walt Disney himself, back at the beginning of, of the history of the company, thought that through animals, you could tell a lot of, of, of stories um, uh, with human or without human beings. And uh, I, I would say even, even with Snow White, the very first movie that, that the company did, you, you, you have this very important role played by, by, by animals in general. And then uh, it's important to say that Walt Disney himself was probably one of the first uh, uh, environmentalist, which is a very tough word to say when you're not English. Um, and he was, he was really into it. And at the end of the 40s, he created this True Life Adventures TV series, which also uh, produced movies, some movies which went to, to, to the big screen. Won eight Academy Awards with it. And it's probably one of the first like wildlife movies ever. Um, and it's interesting when you see the map, when you look at the map of the True Life Adventures and where those movies take place, most of them take place in North America because at the time it was much more complicated to travel with, with materials and everything. So he would give six months to people with, I mean, to go like in Alaska with cameras and film whatever they, they would be able to film. And they were like the very first wildlife movies with a Cousteau one in the 50s to really like make it to to the big screen or, 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 or to the Academy Awards. So it has always been there. And back in 2005, uh, actually 2003, when I met the producer of March of the Penguins, and I decided to co-finance and acquire the film for France on behalf of Disney, uh, I, I did it because I really love those type of films. And uh, I really thought that there were a, a, a cinematographic dimension to this movie and the story and mainly the story is great because whatever the genre of the film you have, whether it's a documentary, whether it's an animated film, whether it's a movie in black and white, whether it's a horror movie or a love story, whether it's French or American or British, uh, if the story is great, the movie would be great. And it, within March of the Penguins, the story was so incredible that, that I really wanted to be part of it. So we co-financed it, we distributed it, and it became this huge phenomenon. Um, and then I, I, I really thought that it was Disney's place in this troubled time to come back with wonderful nature films. So um, I put together the idea of Disney Nature, sold it to Bob Iger, uh, who bought it, and uh, it became Disney Nature uh, in 2008 with the idea of doing one big cinematographic movie based on a very strong story invented by nature and do one every year, um, and for those films to inspire people. And I always say, even a movie which hasn't been seen that much, like, like Wings of Life or Crimson Wing, and we might be able to see a, a, a clip of Crimson Wing, 
uh, which were the very first movie we did back in 2008 and 2009. Even if only three million people saw this movie worldwide, including TV and DVD and VOD and theatrical, which is nothing, three million people, when you think about it, um, then if out of those three million people, 10 of them, it's going to change the life of 10 of them because they are going to become a uh, flamingo specialist or cameraman or director or work for an NGO or decide to give money or time to someone caring for the flamingos or Lake Natron, then it would be a success. We'll just go back for a moment to March of the Penguins because it was a very successful film, in some ways the most successful of the nature films so far. Why do you think it was so successful and how did it do for you in the US? Well, we didn't have the film in the US, weirdly speaking. Uh, it did very well for Warners and Nagio because they co-owned the movie in the US and it did $77 million, won an Academy Awards, remained for a long time the biggest French film ever in the US. Um, and uh, it did very well across the world because I think Earth did, what, 115 kids in the world, 120? And March of the Penguins probably did 125. So it, it, it was huge and won a lot of prizes. But I think at the end of the day, coming back to the story, the story was the heart of this film. It's an incredible story that, the, I mean, you knew because you're in this business and, and you love nature and everything, but 99% of the population didn't know. They all discovered this incredible way of, of, of living, of reproducing, uh, the role of the male, the role of the female, uh, the, the instinct of those animals, and people were just blown away by that. So that's a very important part of, of the success. And then I think that the way they work, and I mean, it's, it's very Charlie Chaplin-esque. Charlie Chaplin-esque. Charlie Chaplin-esque. And I think it, unconsciously in, in the public mind, it reminded something. Um, and and it's, it's a place where nobody can go, where nobody goes. So, and, and, and I think it's also a way for, for whomever wanted to go and see this film to spend 90 minutes or 80 minutes in a place where they would never go anyway. Mm -hmm. So, but most important is really the story, which was so strong. Because at the end of the day, the images themselves were not pristine. I mean, they were like super 16 for most of them. And if you watch it today and you, you watch the underwater scenes, it's pretty, it's, not very nice images. Now, in a way, I think one of the obvious questions about Disney nature is why does Disney get involved with filming real animals in the first place? With the cost of CGI coming down, we saw Jungle Book just recently, and with the cost of filming nature films at that level rising so rapidly, why bother at all? I think it's two totally different ways of seeing things. Uh, CGI is a technical way to help human being stories to be told with animals into it. So it's pure fiction. When Disney Nature and wildlife documentaries are about telling what the story invented by nature. And um, with CGI, it wouldn't work. When we do The Lion King in 2D animation back in 1993, um, it, it cannot be filmed in the wild. Um, it's going to be done in CGI by John Favreau, uh, so it's going to be extremely uh, realistic, like The Jungle Book, for those who have seen The Jungle Book. So you will see Mufasa and Simba and Rafiki, but in, in CGI. And but it tells a story which is a story invented by human beings. African cats, which basically takes place in the same place with the same type of, of animals, um, is uh, it's not a story invented by men. It's a story invented by nature. So to me, CGI will never, ever kill uh, uh, wildlife documentaries. And the only thing is that instead of using a, a tamed chimpanzee in a, in a movie, you will be able to use uh, a CGI, so no animals will be hurt during the, the filming, as we say. So you would see real-life animals, filming of uh, real animals, 
as being essential to the idea of Disney nature oh, all yeah. the way through. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. No question. Now, what was the first uh, film that you decided to make, having created Disney nature in 08? What was the first film? And how did you reach the decision as to which animals you might film? It must be a, you know, there must be an endless cast list. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the first one was The Crimson Wing uh, because when the producer and the director uh, came to see me, to talk to me about the, the film, um, I was very touched by this incredible story of, for some unre unknown reasons, every November, half a million flamingos during one night uh, land on this lake, which is salty, which is hot, which is near a volcano, which has a lot of good things for them, obviously, but also totally inhuman. And um, why do they do that? Where do they come from? Where do they live afterwards? And, and, uh, and, and the place itself is so incredible that it was not a movie about flamingos. It was a movie about the Lake Natron, flamingos, and and, and the addition of the two. Plus the fact that it's probably one of the first show, like wildlife show, that the human beings ever seen. Because that's where everything started. And probably millions of years ago, some first human beings were witnessing this. And we are in a situation where, and, and at the time this is the discussion we had with producer and the, di and, and, and the director, this will probably not exist anymore in 10 years or 20 years no. because of like industry coming around the lake and everything. So after millions of years of this, it's probably, I mean, we have, it's like one minute to midnight. So let's put it on film and keep it forever. So at the time, the movie was called Dreamscape. So it has nothing to do in the title with flamingos. And then we changed it to Crimson Wing. It's a beautiful movie with probably one of the best uh, soundtrack ever for a movie, for any movie. By the way, a lot of uh, those musics have been, have been used um, in, in commercials since then. And, and I love it. And maybe we should watch a clip. Yeah, we have a clip. Uh, we'll have a look for those who have not seen it. So this movie had a, a, a very interesting story. And then, um, yeah, it was the very first movie we did. Now, already after six or eight movies, however many Disney natures have come to light in the last eight years or so, you've made a name for, well, this is a great example, wonderful photography, but also telling very powerful emotional stories. What is your main aim with the series? What's the, the one thing that you, the one box you have to tick with the making of a Disney nature film? Storytelling. And I mean, there's not only one box to tick because if you say storytelling, then you can have a bad cinematography with a great story. And of course, we want a great story with a great cinematography. Um, and it's, it's, but, but the story is at the heart of everything. And when you have a very powerful story, like the one we had in African Cats, for instance, um, then, then you have a great film, that's all. And, and this is like any other movie and, and any, again, whatever the genre is, a story is at the heart of everything. So yeah, the story. So how would you set Disney nature apart from, there are great documentary specials where people spend a fortune on filming particular animals, particular locations, events, but what do you hope sets Disney nature apart from a documentary, a special? where they spend a lot of money on you know, filming the, the migration in Africa, for example. What are you looking for that is different? I'm looking for engaging characters. And in those stories invented by nature, which is, again, a very central thing, uh, engaging characters. And um, in, in Born in China, which we produced, the baby pandas or, or, the, or the snow leopards are very engaging characters. Uh, Oscar in Chimpanzee is one of them as well. Uh, in African cats, the cheetahs and the, and the lion families are very engaging. And this is what we need. This is really what we need. I think some of you saw Monkey Kingdom last night. 
the story of Maya, which is a true story, which has been told by us, I mean to us, by Wolfgang Dieters, the, the, science, the German scientist who has been living there for like 45 years, uh, is a very powerful story. And that's the reason why we do the movie. If we don't have, if we don't know that we, we, we will probably have a very powerful story invented by nature with engaging characters, we won't do the film. And, and uh, interestingly enough, in Crimson Wing, we didn't have engaging characters. We had a very powerful story, but we didn't follow one given character or one family, or because it's too tough, there are flamingos, which, which was not the case in Bears, which was not the case in Monkey Kingdom, which is not the case in Born in China, which was not the case in March of the Penguins, in a way, because even if we didn't give a name to the penguins, we were following kind of the same one. So, so looking back on Crimson Wing, would you, if you were to do it again, for many good reasons, would you try and focus more on an individual? Or no, would because you just say you can't do that? Yeah, this on, this, on this one you can't do that. If I would have to, to do it again, I would do it the same way. So you want to recognize an individual? No, I don't want to recognize an individual, but I want people to be engaged by, 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 by a character. So it goes through probably recognizing one character. But even if you don't, I mean, um, taking the example of March of the Penguins, we don't name the penguins. We didn't name the penguins. But in a way, we were following one or, or the principle of one. So, I mean, there, there's no recipes per se. And um, we are working on a movie with, with um, uh, Keith, uh, which is called Blue, or Dolphin Oasis, whatever. Uh, it's, it's an underwater movie. And underwater is not the same thing as uh, the Maasai Mara or as uh, uh, Sri Lanka. So you, 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 you cannot have recipes. Again, the story is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. Now, of the other Disney natures that you have uh, overseen, which of the ones do you hold out yourself as being the most successful, that have, been, that have achieved the most in those terms that you've just laid out? I would say African Cat. Okay. We, we have a clip of African Cat, I think. Yeah, we do. I don't know whether it's in the right order, but if we can show a clip of African Cat. The beauty of this film is that when Keith came to see me back in 2007 with the idea of African cats, he, he, has, he had been working then uh, on Big Cat's Diary a lot, and uh, he really knew the place very well, and he, he knew the character. And um, he came with the idea of, of having three African cats families that we would follow, lions, cheetahs, and leopards, uh, and a little bit like 24, which at the time was the most successful TV series uh, we, we, we would follow one and then the other and then come back to the first one and then the third one would have a common story with the second one and so forth and it would be like a, a thriller in nature. And, um, and the idea was great. And uh, Keith, I mean, started producing the movie and directing it. And after like three weeks, uh, Cheetah and the Five Cubs were discovered by, by, by Sophie at the time, Sophie Darlington. And, um, and we followed that story, and then we followed the lion story. But, but the leopard story really didn't come together, and, and there were nothing to be told. So we didn't do the, the, the leopard story. And at the end of the, of the day, and we are talking with Keith about that, it's actually a good thing, because nature gave us a wonderful story with just cheetahs and lions, and we didn't need the leopard story. And it actually made the film much better, because you have those two... Uh, families of cheetahs and, 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 and lions who have the same, the same enemy, which is Kali, which we saw. And this is a great drama, which we didn't invent at all. Um, and it has been given by nature. And when you see that, you don't need CGI. It's much better to go there and film it than, than having CGI to invent something which wouldn't be that true. This is entirely true. So that, that's the beauty of it, and that's the reason why, to me, African cats really like tick all the boxes. All the other tick 
90 or 99 percent of the boxes, but this one even more. How important do you think emotions are in the telling of a story like this? Well, emotion is key because, uh, uh, I mean, emotion, first of all, a lot of emotions go through the images. You can watch this without any narration whatsoever, uh, maybe a little bit of music, and, and you get the emotion from the five curbs and the attack. You have fear. You have, you, I mean, you don't know what's going to happen to the, to, to the babies. And so you have the emotion through the images. And the, well, that's what's beautiful with nature. I mean, the beautiful nature of photography uh, still can, can give you a lot of emotion. Uh, but then, yeah, I mean, if you add to that the, the real story which comes with it, if you take the story of Maya or in, in, in Monkey Kingdom, uh, you get even more emotion, and emotion is very important. Uh, in motion pictures, you have emotion, or in emotion, you have motion from motion pictures. So you need that. You need emotion. Movies is about emotion. So you need it. So I guess in that sense, it's just like any drama at all, whether it's yeah, written by course, man or by course. nature, it's about tension, it's about... Yeah, whether it's animated, whether it's live action, whether it's superheroes or, or a small like, student film, emotion is about... I mean, it's all about emotion and, and, and story, yeah. Now, I, it came as a surprise to me in the making of Born in China, which is based in China, that... Um, that Disney actually, you know, I guess one of the questions I had asked and wondered about was what is the commitment of Disney to conservation? What is the, the wider goal? And it came as a surprise to me to discover that actually Disney was wanting to put money back, whether it's into snow leopard conservation or, or panda. Tell us a little bit about conservation and Disney. Conservation is, is key, uh, is actually at the heart of the Disney Nature project or enterprise. Uh, Disney has always uh, been involved in conservation with the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund, which is uh, based out of uh, Florida uh, at Animal Kingdom, which is one of the parks that Disney owns, uh, which is a wonderful park with, with, uh, with live animals, no CGI animals. Um, and uh, the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund has been extremely active in the past decades. Uh, giving a lot of uh, uh, funds to NGOs around the world. Um, and when I created Disney Nature, I really insisted on the fact that I wanted to make sure that part of the revenues, uh, before net income, before, because otherwise it's always easy not to give back anything, uh, would go to conservation. So the first one we did was on Earth, when we released Earth in the US. We, the movie did $32 million box office, but the first weekend, uh, we took a part of the box office and we, we gave it to the Nature Conservancy and we planted 3 million trees in the Atlantic Forest uh, in Brazil. And then we did the same thing with ocean and every single movie lining up. So we worked with many different NGOs from Conservation International to Jane Goodall Institute to uh, WWF, um, Wildlife Society, Nature Conservancy, and everything. And um, we created uh, corridors in Kenya uh, with Jane Goodall. We did a lot of things in Gabon, um, Bahamas to protect the coral reefs uh, with ocean. Many, many things. And that's with uh, the movies uh, and the results of the movies based, based out of the US. And then in the countries where we are releasing, we also do the same thing. So for instance, in France, where all the movies have been, have been released, we worked with other NGOs, but, uh, and sometimes the same, but sometimes others. For instance, Conservation International is not really big in France or not existent at all. So we go with, with other NGOs. So at the end of the day, if you add up everything we have done, it's quite a lot of different programs in different parts of the world with different NGOs, uh, but always concentrated on that. And even if the movie doesn't do, uh, doesn't bring money at the end, I still want money to be, to, to, to be used for conservation because that's, that's key. I mean, you cannot do this type of movie and just don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the films that uh, I enjoyed the most was Chimpanzee, 
which was filmed by Martin Kolbeck. In fact, I think we have a clip, don't we, of uh, chimpanzee. Um, but I think, what, what did you put the money, before we look at the clip, what did the money go to there? Jen Goodall Institute. Uh -huh. uh, and she actually remained a Disney Nature ambassador after this film. She was so moved by chimpanzee, which is an incredible story because almost like a year or two years in the filming, one day, Alistair Fothergill, who directed the movie, called me and said, we don't have a movie anymore, that's, that's it. Oscar, our main character, which we were following for the past two years, or whatever, 18 months, is, I mean, his mother's gone, and he's not going to survive. And uh, so it was a drama for us, because, I mean, first of all, the poor little kid was going to die, and, and, uh, and all the work which, which, which has been done on chimpanzee for the past two years was, was just destroyed, and, uh, and something happened uh, which was totally incredible. Maybe we should look at the clip. Yeah. Can we see? Thank you. So this happened, and uh, then when Jane Goodall saw that, she was just amazed, because it was the first time ever that an adoption from a male um, was filmed. And, um, and it became the, the heart of the film. So we went from not having a movie to having a great story to tell. So it became the, the story of Oscar. But uh, we, we couldn't expect it. So it's really, a, again, a story invented by nature, as we say. Yeah. Now, I think one of the questions that I'm asked that uh, is a little bit sort of embarrassing or puts me on the spot is, will we see this film, like I'm thinking now, Born in China? Um, will we see it in the UK? And in fact, you know, th there is no cinematic, there's no theatrical distribution for most of these films within the UK. Now, why historically is this the case and why are there some exceptions? Well, I think uh, the issue is uh, the theatrical business for wildlife movies in, in the UK is because you've done a, a, a such a great job, you and all the people involved in, in the BBC and BBC movies, uh, a great job showing incredible movies for free on TV every Sunday night, I think. Uh, so I don't think the British public is willing to go and pay whatever it costs to go and see a movie, 10 pounds maybe, to see something they have the feeling they could see on TV. So that's the reason why um, there's probably no potential, no demand uh, in the UK for wildlife movie on the big screen. Uh, it's interesting to see that Earth, March of the Penguins, which are the two biggest movies ever in terms of wildlife, worldwide, didn't do anything here. And even if Earth was, was a, a, a local movie in a way, because done by British people, it, it didn't work. And uh, March of the Penguin, which was such a huge hit in the US, and usually what works in the US works in the UK, didn't work at all. So I think that the issue is the UK. I mean, you have such powerful TV offer that people don't want to go and pay for it. It's not the case elsewhere. It's not the case in Germany. It's not the case in, in, in France. It's not the case in Japan. Uh, not for all the movies, but, but there is a market for wildlife films in theaters, and now in the US. So that, that's, that's, that's great for those films, and of course, too bad also, that UK, which is such an important market, because for, if, if, I mean, if you take the worldwide box office, uh, after China and the US, you have the UK, which is the third biggest country in the world. But for the genre we are talking about, it's totally non-existent. That's a real shame. I, I mean, the, the, in France, they're popular. I mean, it's very interesting. What do, you, what do you think the difference is between, is it just French television does not provide as much wildlife? I, I think there are, there are several things. First of all, we don't have the offer you have here on TV, that's for sure. Two, I think that we have a, uh, I mean, with Cousteau, we had tradition of uh, uh, wildlife movie on the big screen. Remember that, I think it's 1954, the Palme d'Or in Cannes was given to Le Monde du Silence, The World of Silence from Jean-Jacques Cousteau and Louis Malle. Mm. So, 60 years ago, a wildlife movie got the Palme d'Or.
So when, when, you're, when you grow up in a country like this, and you like cinema, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the, of cinematography. You don't, I mean, you have genres, but it's, it's part of it. And then we had huge success with Microcosmos, with Wing Migration, with Ocean, with African Cats, with March of the Pink. I mean, all those movies, it's, yeah, people, people love to do that. And, and to me, and coming back to when we created Disney Nature, I really wanted to, to give to the public an alternative with their kids. When you have a six to 10 year or six to 12 year old kid, back in 2000, I mean, less now, but I, w I would say uh, until 2010, you really had the choice between an animated film or an animated film. No, and nothing else. And what I wanted to, to do with Disney Nature in, is telling the parents or whatever, the grandparents, you now have the chance, the choice between an animated movie and a wildlife film. You don't have to go and see, I mean, you can go and see a Disney animated movie, of course, but then you can also go and see a Disney Nature movie. Or you can go and see a DreamWorks movie and a Disney Nature film. So it opens up the, the, the solutions when you have to go out with your kid to go and see a movie. So now there's more things because there's a lot of, like, uh, I don't know how you call them, I mean, the, the Harry Potter and, 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 but Divergent, I can, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a bigger, bigger offer in terms of uh, teenager movies today, but uh, I really wanted that. I wanted people to have a, a choice between different genre of films. How do you see Disney nature evolving in future? I mean, you, the, the films that you've made so far have got great cinematography. They've also got strong stories, strong characters in common. But how do you see the, the genre, the brand evolving? I, I, w I would say uh, we have to keep going in the same direction. Again, great storytelling, great cinematography. And as long as we will be able to identify those great stories and, and, and the great people behind uh, the cameras and, and, and directing those movies, we'll be in a good position. So we have like movies lining up until 2020. Uh, I don't know what will happen afterward, but everything will depend on the story that, that we will be able to tell. And that, I mean, I don't know, I mean, maybe something that nobody knows about is going to happen somewhere and it's going to be a wonderful story to, to, to tell in six years from now. But we will carry on like one film a year, telling a great story with one thing which is key, is that those films don't, co don't cost that much, but I really insist on giving, giving you guys uh, and the producer who work on the movie and the directors the time you need, the time they need to make a great film. Because the difference between uh, a, a high quality wildlife movie and a not that high quality wildlife movie is the time you spend on location. And uh, you need two, you need three, you need four seasons sometimes to get the images you need. And if you stay there only one season, you could be lucky. But if you're not lucky, then the movie will be a piece of crap. So you need to be, we, I mean, time is something which is non-negotiable. And uh, we had the example on Bears, actually, where Keith and his team spent um, two and a half seasons on location. Uh, and if you include winter, four seasons on location uh, to make Bears. And there were another team who, were, who was doing uh, the same movie, but they decided to stay in three months, and they wanted to do it in 3D, and they did it in 3D, but in three months. Um, and at the end, the movie was nowhere, I mean, it was the same story, it was the, the same principle, but the, the movie didn't do anything, because it was, it was not as good. And not because it was not a Disney nature movie, because they just didn't decide to, to, to give enough time to the production team. And time is essential. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Fair, yeah, absolutely. OK, I think uh, we should wind it up there. Thank you very much. And thank uh, um, Jean-Francois for giving us his insights into it. I think it's been very interesting for most of us who are documentary makers. 
to get these insights from Disney Nature. It's quite a different world, really. And, and, and I would like to thank you, Brian, for this exercise. I would like to thank Keith and Carol and Matt here from Disney Nature team, and Lucy and Peter for uh, having us. I think Lucy just left, but for having us at Wall Screen. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>